Analyze your gameplay, reflect on your actions. These are things we hear all the time when we're trying to improve, but how do we address them correctly? And more importantly, what do we do if we've hit a plateau? Well, if you're experiencing slow progress or just want to speed up your progress, the reflective cycle is here to help. Most self-improvement boils down to three stages. First, we perform an action, we then reflect on this action, and then we change and adapt our actions based on feedback. Action, reflection, adaptation. There's not really anything fancy going on on the surface, so the reflective cycle might sound bland and obvious to some people. But this is fundamentally how all athletes analyze the actions and decisions, and applying it to your gameplay correctly is key to taking your self-improvement to the next level. Let's get to it then. As we said, the reflective cycle always starts with a particular action. You can think back to the most recent game you played and pick out something memorable, like a mistake you made, to follow along. For the sake of this video, we'll be following Henry's reflective cycle. In Henry's most recent game, he found himself defending a 2v4 during a round. The odds were not on his side. With quick thinking and advice from his teammates, he came up with three possible choices. One, to stack one site with his teammate and play hard defense. Two, to take an aggressive peek on A long, potentially winning one kill and pushing the odds in their favor. Or three, simply giving up the round in order to save their weapons and economy for the next round. After some deliberation, Henry chooses option two, peeking aggressively to throw the enemy off and potentially help his team equalize. He peeks the enemy, White swings too far out and misses his shots, dying in the process and losing his team the round. So, Henry has identified an action that he wants to analyze. It's now time to reflect on this action. The reflection phase is held up by three pillars that we need to address. First, what happened? Second, what should have happened? And third, what do I need to change for the future? Answering the first pillar might sound easy on the surface, just remember what happened in the game. Henry peeked aggressively and that's that. The problem is that we're humans, and we fall into cognitive traps and biases all the time. Our brains forget or misremember things, and when it doesn't, it makes up stories to rationalize our actions. It's vital, therefore, to remove as many subjective elements from our analysis as possible, whether that's through getting a second opinion, recording your games, or using the in-game replay system. Just use objective data wherever possible to minimize bias. Now, the more complicated part. What should have happened? Think of this question as a way to take a step back and put your actions into perspective. This is the step where you'll ask yourself questions like, why was I in this position in the first place? What would a pro have done? What were my decisions leading up to this scenario? When analyzing whether an action was good or bad, we need to split these actions into two categories, intention and execution. Intention is your goal or rationale with an action, basically what you aim to achieve. Execution is the practical application of your intention, so how well you did the action, whether you missed your shots, reloaded too soon, etc. It could be the case that your execution of an action is great, but your intention is all wrong. Or it could be the case that your intention is great, but your execution of that intention is flawed. So you had the right idea, but you just kind of messed it up or missed your shots or something. Answering where the problem lies is the first step in addressing it. It's no use practicing your execution, aim, utility use, or anything mechanical if the problem is your decision making or game sense. Understand whether your flaws or mistakes lie in your intentions or your execution of these intentions. So let's analyze Henry's intention to start with. Again, in his mind, he has three choices. To stack a sight against a 2v4, peek aggressively to get a potential kill, or to save his weapon for his team's economy. To gauge whether Henry made the right choice, he needs to analyze the risk and reward associated with each one of these decisions. To do this, we've made a useful system that we call RRE. We cover RRE in more detail in our mid-round mindset video, but in short, RRE is reliability, reward, effectiveness. At its core, RRE is just a way to test how good a decision is. If your intention is reliable and it has a high reward, congrats, you have an effective intention. If your intention has a low reliability and low reward, not so much. Think of RRE like a machine. You give it a bunch of variables and it spits out an answer. Now, some of you might be thinking that RRE is too subjective. Who gets to decide that map control, for example, is more important than economy? And this is sort of the point. The way you analyze certain scenarios and decisions will be heavily influenced by the philosophy or lens you view them through. Henry's coach, for example, might view the scenario through the lens of team economy. He puts more value on economy, and therefore, in his mind, Henry's ballsy play wasn't the best choice. Henry's IGL, however, views the scenario through the lens of man count, and thinks that the rewards of getting a kill and increasing the odds of winning the round are much more favorable than the risk of potentially losing a gun. Someone else might view the scenario through the lens of teamwork, and criticize Henry for not playing together with his teammate. 
There's a wide spectrum of lenses to view a scenario through, and, as disappointing as it may sound, there really are no objective answers. It all depends on the reliability and reward of a decision, and the way you determine these is largely a product of the lens you happen to choose, based on your overall game philosophy. The best tip we can give you is to analyse the decision through as many lenses as you can. Over time, if you're consistent, you'll start to favour some lenses over others, and be able to choose the most relevant one depending on the scenario. Another big tip is to gain a better understanding of what a correct play looks like in practice. Watch more pro games, talk back and forth about strategies with teammates, and overall, just be a lot more cognizant about your actions and intentions in game. With all of this, however, it's important to keep one thing in mind, and that's outcome bias. This is where we use the outcome of a scenario to justify the validity of a decision. Let's be clear here, this is bad. Henry could have done a 360 no-scope and won the round, but does that mean that this 360 no-scope was a good intention? Absolutely not. He may have won the round, but that changes nothing about whether 360 no-scopes are a good idea. Another thing to note is that as you improve, your depth of analysis will improve too. What we mean by this is that on day one, your analysis may only consist of something simple like, I need to practice my aim. However, as time goes on and as your knowledge develops, this may turn into something like, I need to practice my left side flicks, I tend to overshoot them. Even though your first loop of the reflective cycle may only solve surface level problems, over time, if you're persistent, you'll start to address more fundamental issues. So, after all this, Henry ends his reflection phase with the following conclusion. He had three choices, and according to his analysis, he believes he made the right one by peaking. This means that his intention wasn't the issue, his execution was. And revisiting the scenario, he kind of agrees. He sees that he overextended his peak and messed up the spray. The logical next step, therefore, is to solve this problem, which leads us to the adaptation phase. Now that we know what the problem is, we can look for ways to remedy it. For a lot of people, the first thing that'll come to mind is, I just need to play more, and over time I'll improve and make fewer mistakes. But this is only part of the equation. The point of this video isn't to give you a way to improve, but the optimal way to improve. Football players don't get better at the game by cramming in as many matches as possible. They isolate their weaknesses, learn from their coaches, educate themselves, and lay out their training sessions intelligently. Similarly, a chess player with a weak endgame will practice their endgames for a couple of hours on top of their normal matches, instead of mindlessly playing game after game for five hours. Too many FPS players think that the only form of training is either playing more games or aim training, but this is not the case. According to Peak by Anders Ericsson, there are countless ways to train, and choosing the most optimal form of training will not only save time, but will propel you ahead of the vast majority of other players who rush this stage. If you take just one thing from everything we've said so far, let it be this. Work smarter, not harder. So, if just playing more games and aim training are not ideal, then what are the optimal ways to practice? We believe that all forms of practice can be split into several categories. Among these are isolated practice, cognizant gameplay, expert-led practice, education, and psychological conditioning. Now, we don't have the time to go over all of these methods, but let's briefly cover the most relevant one. Isolated practice is where you focus on a specific part of your gameplay. You create an environment where you can guarantee the frequency of practice and reduce what's at stake. For example, Henry wants to improve his peaks, but simply playing more ranked games is not a great way to achieve this. Think about it. During a ranked game, he'll only be peaking his enemies maybe two or three times per round. And even worse, his mind will be clogged up with other things like ability use, positioning, etc. Instead, if Henry just spends 5-10 to 10 minutes in the range practicing his peaks, and then goes into a couple of games of deathmatch, he'll have 1. Isolated his peaks as the main focus of practice, 2. Guaranteed that his peak practicing is a lot more time efficient, and 3. Not care too much about the outcome of the match, since he doesn't have any elo on the line. This is a much smarter way to improve his peaks. Instead of spending 40 or 50 minutes in a game just trying to practice his peaks, he can spend a fraction of that time to isolate his weak points and get a much more efficient training session. In most cases, isolated practice will be one of the best ways to improve your gameplay. These training methods deserve a video of their own, so if training methods are something you want us to cover in more detail in the future, let us know in the comments. There are times, however, where you either don't know which training method to use, or none of these methods apply. In cases like this, all we can really do is highlight the mistake or issue in our minds, and emphasize its solution so that we're less likely to commit it again in the future. The last thing to cover before we close the reflective cycle loop is iterations. Going through the reflective cycle once or twice, though it will help, won't make a huge difference. Multiple iterations of the cycle are needed to truly hone in on solid conclusions. And though the reflective cycle might sound like way too much to think about, remember that it doesn't need to be massively detailed. Even though your analysis will be thorough between sessions and between games, over time, as the reflective cycle becomes more automated in your mind, you'll start analysing your gameplay semi-consciously between rounds, and even within rounds. For example, you may peek an enemy for a gunfight, and when you back off, whether you realise it or not, you'll be subconsciously going through a basic form of the reflective cycle. You'll briefly analyse your positioning, your spray pattern, and your movement, so that your next peek can be more effective. 
Basically, the more iterations of the reflective cycle you go through, the more ingrained it will become in your mind, and the easier and quicker it'll feel in the moment. And even though we followed Henry's reflective cycle to solve problems and mistakes in this video, remember that we can use the reflective cycle to embed and maintain positive aspects of our gameplay too. So the reflective cycle is not just a problem solver, it's also a positive reinforcement tool. Now that we've seen what a full iteration of the reflective cycle looks like, let's blitz through a bunch of issues that a lot of players face and use the reflective cycle to solve them. 1. Giving bad or convoluted callouts. Through the lens of Team Intel, we can say that our callouts are too long or too hectic. We decide to be cognizant of this issue by reminding ourselves to calm down during hectic rounds. We may place a sticky note on our monitor as an external reminder, we may introduce breathing exercises before games, or simply practice short and snappy callouts for a couple minutes each day. 2. Recall Control We determine that our execution of recall control is lacking for certain weapons. We educate ourselves on the different recall patterns by hopping into the range or looking up some YouTube guides. We then dedicate a couple minutes of isolated practice each day controlling our recoil, and within a week or two are miles ahead of where we started. 3. Reloading after every gunfight Using the reflection phase, we identify that we have a habit of reloading too often, and should instead be ready for more enemies shortly after gunfights. We ask an immortal level friend what to do, and use YouTube to search for ways to remedy this. We choose to psychologically condition ourselves not to reload so often by unbinding the reload key on our keyboard. Over time, the negative feedback of pressing the reload key will cause this behaviour to go extinct. The reflective cycle enables us to analyse a scenario, pinpoint specific positives and negatives, and allows us to create an action plan on how to reinforce or fix these things. Reflective cycle is the handbook you flick through when you want a practical checklist on improvement for anything. Now, we've left out a ton of detail in this video to make it shorter, but if the reflective cycle is something you want to learn more about, we've made a dedicated video covering these nuances and intricacies on our second channel that we're launching right now, Strategize 2. So, if you want to learn about this and a ton of other subjects like practice methods, communication, or counter stressing, we'll be uploading mini podcasts on these subjects on a frequent basis. You can find the link to our second channel in the description and in a pinned comment below. If you found this video helpful in some way, be sure to drop us a like and subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you for watching.